Well, we made it to 39. Some of these topics require a lot of space. And I'm just going to try to boil it down to the minimal amount of writing. I'm not sure I'll be successful because I haven't haven't written it all in yet because that might confuse the issue somehow, so we'll just try to do it. So let's see. We start with it's compare and contrast. So mean versus median. Now what does that mean? Well, they're both measures of center. And so one of them is the average and the other one is the center uh, in terms of halfway along the data set if you arrange the data in order. So we know how to compute it. Maybe that's not important. Maybe we say we use the mean. So the measures of center we use the median with skewed distributions or with outliers. Maybe that makes sense. Otherwise we use the mean. So if it's symmetric, no outliers, the mean's a good measure of center. It comes out to be the same as the median. If it has some, uh, has some desirable qu qualities that the median doesn't have, say if the median, if you're computing center with whole numbers, then the median will be mostly just like one of those numbers, where the mean might represent the center in a more effective way. So we tend to use the mean with symmetric distributions and the median with skewed distributions or if there's outliers. So far I'm, I'm okay. Uh, parameters versus statistics. The uh, parameters, they're uh, characteristics of the population. So that's a parameter. Or a data set or a sample. So maybe I should say or a sample because it matches up a sample. So a characteristic of a sample is a statistic. A characteristic of a po population is a parameter. When you say mean, it could be a parameter if it's a population or it could be mean, a, a statistic if it's a sample. Experiment versus survey. In an experiment A treatment is imposed. So if you're just measuring things without imposing a treatment, you haven't done an experiment, you've just done a survey. Independent versus disjoint events, eh, I don't know. Independent says probability A and B is probability A times probability B. And disjoint says that a and B is empty, which is kind of weird. So A and B can't happen together. Maybe I should write it that way. A and B can't happen together. So if A is getting heads when you toss a coin and B is tails, then A and B would be disjoint. Disjoint events aren't independent. Independent events aren't disjoint, so they don't share any characteristics. So you have to be careful what you do. Simple random sampling, we said that on the previous slide. All samples of that size have the same chance. Other kinds of random sampling often try to make sure each individual has the same chance, but they don't necessarily make sure all samples of that size have the same chance. Explanatory versus response variable. This is maybe a regression topic. Um, explanatory, we would think, is the cause, and the response would be the effect. So when we change this number, we expect that number to change along with it. Um, maybe that's the way to think about it. Influential value versus outlier. Influential says the regression line changes if it is removed or added. 
outlier just says not uh, following the linear pattern. So you can have values that just don't seem to be on the line, but if you take them away, they don't change the position of the line very much. So the influential values are the ones extreme in the x direction, so the ones near the boundaries of the data set that aren't part of the linear pattern, then if you take them out, the line can move quite a bit. If those values are in the center of the data in the x direction, even though they're not part of the line, if you take them away, the line doesn't move very far. Law of large numbers. The law of large numbers says uh, x bar gets close to mu as n increases. I'm in the wrong color here. That's funny. Okay. And this one over here says uh, that's law of large numbers. X bar becomes normal as n increases. So we use the central limit theorem when we compute a t statistic or a z statistic when we don't think the population is normally distributed because it has x bar in it and x bar becomes normal when n is large even if the population isn't normal. That fact is the central limit theorem. We're up here, population distribution versus x bars distribution. Well, this would be the sampling distribution of the sample mean. I'm not sure what to say. Maybe we'd say uh, both have the same mean. Uh, the standard deviation of x bar is the standard deviation of the population divided by root n, like that. So they differ in, they are similar in that they have the same mean, but they're different in that they have different, different standard deviations. If the population is normal, x bar has a normal distribution. Otherwise, if the population is not normal, x bar has a different distribution tending towards the normal distribution and tends more and more towards the normal distribution as the sample size grows larger. Okay. Confidence interval for you versus hypothesis test. I don't have a P in there. That bothers me. Versus hypothesis test. There we go. Uh, they're similar. Uh, both give information about mu, true enough. And they both could tell you whether mu could be a certain number. I'm trying to think if you want to say compare and contrast, that's a compare where they're the same. How are they different? Um, I could say that hypothesis test um, can be used in cases where no confidence interval exists. There are cases, uh, but we don't get to do them in this class. Say in analysis of variance, you do hypothesis testing, but you don't really use confidence intervals that much because you're just worried about something happening that's not really represented in terms of just an absolute parameter. So that's why we do both. If we were just st sticking with the kind of statistics that we do in this particular class, we could avoid hypothesis test altogether. But if you go into research somewhere and someone does a hypothesis test because they'll do it in research of humans or, or chemistry or pick a thing, where they're not estimating a mean, they might be doing something else and trying to see if there's been a change, they will quote a p-value and they'll tell you they use this kind of test. And if we didn't talk about testing, you'd have no idea what they're talking about. So we give you both uh, ways of thinking about information so that you stand a chance of maybe interpreting information in the future that involves hypothesis testing, even though we could get by without it right now. Uh, statistically significant versus practically significant. So statistically si significant says that it, what we see is probably not just random variation. 
practically significant says um, the change matters to us. So if you were, say, trying to see whether a particular new kind of medicine reduces fever, and you say you have a fever of 100 degrees, and it manages to reduce fever uh, down to 99.5, you're still pretty sick, so you're not too happy about it. So even though we could prove that that's not random variation to get from 100 to 99.5 because you took this medicine, it won't have any practical significance to you because you really needed to do more. On the other hand, um, that might make sense. You might have practically significant things that you can't really justify statistically because the sample size is too small, that you administer a medication and it seems to be working pretty well, but you only gave it to three people, and that's not a big enough sample to draw any statistical conclusions. And you say, well, it seems to be working, except I just don't have enough uh, evidence to rule out random variation. Keep on going. R near 1 versus R near minus 1. R near 1 says um, almost linear and positive association. And not almost linear negative Hands wearing out negative association. You have to be a little bit careful with R because it's sensitive to outliers. So without outliers, R near 1 indicates almost linear with a positive slope, and R near minus 1 indicates almost linear pattern with a negative slope. Uh, statistically significant versus statistically significant, significant at level alpha, we said. Uh, Probably not random. And the statistically significant at level alpha requires a certain p-value. The 0.05 level is where we would draw the line between not random and random. But you might want to be more sure than the 0.05 level. 0.05 level is, I'm kind of sure, it's I'm pretty, just probably not random variation. But the higher the level of significance, meaning the smaller the alpha is, the more sure you can be that this isn't just random variation, it's just not an unusual experimental result, the chances are the thing we're looking for is actually happening. So sometimes it just depends on the consequences of making the mistake of saying it looks like we should reject the null hypothesis or not. You have to pick the significance level carefully based on the damage that gets done. There's two things that could go wrong. You could not reject the null hypothesis because you set the level at such a small number that it's hard to reach. That might be bad. Or you might reject the null hypothesis when you shouldn't um, because the consequences of making that mistake could be big, so you might 